We're going to finally get to the end of the Mexican-American War and how Arizona became property of the United States on today's Unnamed Real Estate Podcast. Hi there, my name is Charles Ray Dawson, Associate Broker and Residential Sales Manager for ProStar Realty. This is the Unnamed Real Estate Podcast, Episode 62, and I'm looking forward to this being the longest recording session of my entire existence on YouTube. So, I have my water, I got my smoky stick, got some cough drops around here if it gets really bad, because we are going to end the Mexican-American War in this episode. And in this entire series that I've been doing leading up to this point, uh, talking about the history of Arizona and how it became part of the United States of America and no longer belongs to anybody else but us, theoretically. So we'll see how that works out here in the future. So <clears throat> we also this week have uh, Tina on um, and the market numbers and everything like that. She had a meeting on Tuesday that I was able to attend. And um, interesting meeting because as she starts off, she spent most of it talking about rents. And I was like, wow, did I accidentally sign up for uh, an investment and rental um, podcast or something like that? And said, nope, she was talking about rents for uh, serious reasons. So um, let's get started on that. We'll hit our numbers and then we'll dive into the Mexican-American War. So from the um, <clears throat> first bit right here, rents have gone up, but they've plateaued and it is now cheaper to rent than it is to buy. <clears throat> All right, to the tune of about three, you know, three hundred and forty dollars to five hundred dollars more a month to buy a, a to rent a comparable property than to buy it. This is quite the momentous occasion. We have not been this way for quite some time, and we're going to see that in the numbers later on as I, I get to those slides. And this is one of those little precursors of what we start seeing when we start seeing a market slow down. Rents tend to track in front of sales for pricing and stuff, depending on which direction it's going to go. A couple of things we got going on right now is that of the buyers out there, 64% of them are actual buyers who are planning on occupying the property. The rest of them are investors, people who are buying a second home, which aren't counted as an owner occupant <coughs> and your eye buyers. So those are the people out there, open door, next door, those kind of guys who are out there uh, purchasing properties. And we see a lot of those come back later on as continuing um, back on the market, or sometimes they go straight to an investor as a rentals. But what we are seeing is that it has become more expensive to buy right now than to rent. And, but we're also seeing rents, rental properties are starting to show up on the MLS, right? And they've been up um, substantially 58% since September and 12% um, in January 1st, and especially in three to four bedroom rentals. And we're actually starting to see rents come down in four bedroom houses and five bedroom houses, you know, showing a lack of demand. So landlords do not want to pay real estate agents to find them uh, tenants, and they won't if they don't have to. So normally what they do is they will just put a sign up, at, advertise on Craigslist or whatever, and find a tenant on their own. If they're starting to have a hard time doing that, then they will start looking at, at uh, getting real estate agents involved. So the fact that we're starting to see that come up, plus a continuation of our rent numbers here, where we actually see rent is starting to plateau at the higher mark, that suggests a softening in the rental market. This is not instantly going to translate to see more rentals out there. It's not going to all of a sudden occupancy rates aren't going to change, but this is a, a very serious indicator that they've maxed out. Uh, they're, they're squeezing the tenants for as much as they can. And now they're starting to have to, um, you know, come back on it. So that's, that's interesting news and it's an intriguing news and hopefully happy news for you. If you are a tenant out there and not going to be in a position to buy anytime soon. Now, just because on this f first chart here, where we're talking about how much more it is to buy, than to rent, just remember, all right, we had 24.7% annual appreciation from month to month, right? So the property that you were paying $340 more for, for goes up, what would that be? 2% a month, all right? $300,000 house, that means every six months or every month, you are getting an additional $6,000 in equity on top of that. 
So that's what they tell us to go and tell and tell you buyers out there who are like on the bubble of, you know, maybe I'll just rent for a while. You're going to be mi missing out on this appreciation all the time that you do that. Right? And you still don't know what, if the rents are going to, if we, the rents are just going to start going up again. Da, 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 da. You know, overcoming objections, you know, call your lender. So that's was the big takeaway is that rent seemed to be capping out and that's a bigger deal than people think. And, uh, but this is that kind of stuff that professionals pay attention to. Does this mean we're going to go into a sudden buyer's market and everybody out there who I, I'm literally hearing stories of people who sold their houses two years ago, waiting for the crash, right? I want to show you this chart right here. The Cromford report index is an imaginary number that they make up by comparing the seller activity and the buyer activity, right? In a balanced market, right? We would be down here and that amount would be in the hundreds. 2014 was their last buyer, um, buyer's market, balanced market, honestly. That was equal number of houses, equal number of buyers, 100 buyers looking for 100 houses and they're just arguing about floor plans. We have been trending upwards ever since then. And you see 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, we have been in basically a seller's market. It was halfway through 2019 when things started getting really, really up there. Okay. We were cresting over 200 and this is where we start talking a very hot seller's market. All right. And then we spiked up to 2020 until COVID hit. This is your COVID dip. And after a brief period of recovery, we kept going up. This part right here was mostly driven by interest rates, right? The interest rates allowing more people to buy bigger houses to, you know, because they could afford the loan better. This is where we started going up to. So you can almost sit there and say that 2020, all right, up from 2019 to 2020, this is your interest rate push and then COVID hits, knocks us down. Notice we never actually did go into a buyer's market. Even then we're still in a seller's market, right? And then we go up to the point where we recover and then we go stratospheric. Now, why are we going stratospheric is because this time period here is when everybody started working from home. This is when everybody started realizing that if I'm going to spend 22 hours in the same building, I might as well like the building. Uh, this is also when, you know, people started realizing, hey, if I'm only going to work from home, I don't need to be in the same city that my office is in. And people started shuffling around. So that's when we have this really peak craziness, which was last year. And notice we're under where we were last year. So as, as crazy as things are now, last year was worse. And then we see the traditional sliding down. Things get a little bit easier during the heat of the summer and then starts picking up right again. And this is, you can see that just a little bit right here. This is our seasonality and how that works out. So this is where we're at. You see us, we're starting to trend down even more. We were paralleling this. And in fact, you can almost say that our seasonality kicked off a little bit early with that. And we're get, we're starting to come back down. Now, we're not going to be balanced until the, all the way we're down here. And we're not going to be would be considered normal for the last decade until we're down here in the 140s, 160s. But that's where we're at in the world right now. And we're starting to see that on the numbers, all right? Because going to our numbers here, we have our third week in a row of active properties going up. Like we did last year, more houses came on, started coming on the market the third week of March. Now we're continuing on with that trend. Actives this week are 4,660. We're up 173 from the week before. Of those, 2,475 are new properties just listed on the market this week, up 33%. Our come under contracts with the buyer's contingency are 1,113, up 19. Our pendings are down which is interesting to 1,968 down 55 and our contracts with buyers uh, contingency are down 74, right? Which means could mean, could mean that the individual sellers when they're getting that offer are starting to show concer some concern about whether or not they're sure that the buyer who's writing the offer contingent on the sale of their home is going to be able to unload their home. So, 
Watch that space. That's one we're going to track for a while. All right, closings last week are at um, 2,702, which was up 500 from the week before. I'm no longer going to track the uh, weekly uh, changes on that thing because it's, you know, it's so sporadic and, and uh, depends on which week of the month. It, it doesn't make sense to track it week to week. Income soon, soon to a uh, MLS near you is 1,197 new listings. So that's where we're at with the market. Our appreciation is starting to slow down a little bit because remember two uh, months ago it was 27%. Now we're down to 24, but it's still going up. All right. Our rents have capped out and we are continuing on, continuing on. Now, one last thing I wanted to point out to this is because when the the bubble maniacs out there who are going to start freaking out going oh my god here's the bubble here's the bubble here's the bubble this chart right here all right we've maxed out at 2195 all right 2195 dollars for a 1500 to 2000 square foot rental all right the we saw this yes we saw this before the crash but we were also seeing 10% vacancy rates in rentals we're at three percent right now maybe in a week or two you know when we rerun the numbers we'll be looking at maybe four maybe even five that's still very historically low and you'll need to see this time period here all through 2003 all right and through 2004 all right to the first quarter of 2005 rents actually starting to drop and remember 2005 was when things started getting weird pricing ways but we still had two years worth of rents going down before that seriously started impacting the the, the market so take that bubble anyways let's talk about happier things let's talk about the mexican-american war so mexican-american war is the major reason why most of the state of Arizona became part of the United States of America. We've been covering, you know, the history of Mexico. We've uh, been covering the, the Mexican Revolution. Um, we covered, I don't think we really covered some of the reasons why uh, from the Mexican Revolution other than uh, Mexico almost ceased to exist being, or Spain almost ceased to be, uh, exist being because Napoleon ran over the top of it and installed his brother-in-law to be emperor of, of Spain. And Mexico decided, nah, I think we're going to go on our own. And there was a period of time where Mexico was an empire. And there was a period of time when Spain decided to try, try to take Mexico back. There is a period of time there where Mexico got into a violent confrontation with France over pastries. Man, I could go on for an hour and a half after that, just on the pastry war of France and Mexico. Right. But we're not going to get in this because we're talking about our, our, our brush with them, the Mexican-American War. So Texas had a revolution and seceded themselves from Mexico proper. This all happened at the same time period. Pretty much every one of these little states were also trying to separate themselves from Mexico proper. Texas successfully revolted, right? And the Yucatan successfully re uh, revolted, creating the Republic of Yucatan, which did not last very long. They were eventually reconquered by Mexico many years later. But it was the Texas Revolution that um, solidified the beginning of the crazy. And a lot of that has to do with this gentleman right here. Presidente Antonio de Padua Maria Severino Lopez de Santa Ana y Perez de Lebron. All right. Or as historians like to call him, Glass Joe. Right. As if you're a guy like me and you've been playing a lot of war games this year, we nipper and stuff like that, video games especially, but board games, moving little counters around and this and that and the other thing, you're simulating warfare. When computers came out, you started having computer games to simulate warfare. And like all good computer games, you had what's called easy mode. It usually go easy, normal, hard, impossible. 
right? And as generals go and as national leaders go, and I will debate this argument with pretty much anybody out there, all right? Because I know no historians are going to be watching this, right? Santa Ana is glass, Joe. If you are playing on the digital battlefield against the enemy and you zoom in on the opposing general and it's this guy right here, you're playing on easy mode because the guy just sucks. Now, he was president of Mexico many, many, many times. All right. He would get put in charge. He would get kicked out. He would come back. He'd get kicked out. He would, you know, get kicked out, come back, and then say, and the, everybody would say, you know, Santa Ana, save us, and he'd save them, and then they'd kick him out again. All right. This poor bastard just is, is quite the dude. All right. I don't know how Mexico thinks about him. I'm pretty sure, reading between the lines, that this is probably one of those guys that if you were in Mexico City, you love him. Right? If you're in Capital City, you love him. If you're anywhere else in the country, you hate this guy. And that's because he really, he, I mean, he, he's like the very modern model of a modern major dictator. Right? This guy right here had no concept of rule of law. Right? If he liked it, he did it. If he didn't like it, he didn't do it. And that's all there is to it. And if something irritated him, he got it out of the way. If he needed money, he went to the rich, robbed from the rich, kept for himself. And when the rich ran out of money, he went to the church and robbed from the church. And when the church ran out of money, he grabbed random pedestrians on the streets and steal from them. All right. Always for whatever great reason. I mean, look at all the medals this guy had to make. Right. You know how much gold bullion goes into those things? So... Class Joe here, Santa Ana, takes the entire federal government of Mexico, waves his hand and says, nope, we're not doing this federalism anymore. We're doing centralized, centralized government. Everything has to come to capital city. Right? Everything has to be based out of Mexico City. All the individual power out there, all the federalist powers where state rights were able to make their own decisions, not nah, screw that. It's all on me. Right. You want to build a dam there, you come ask me first, right? You want to go, you know, deal with a with an Indian tribe, you come and talk to me first. And that's why the majority of Mexico went screw you and kicked loose in various directions. Now, the one thing <clears throat> General Glasgow was really good at was massacring natives. His entire idea of a military campaign was to wander into a village, kill everybody who looked at him crossways, and walk out the next door. He's not that great a guy. So when the Texas Revolution kicked off, right, that was his entire game plan. So his entire game plan was he was going to march into Texas and kill everybody who looked at him funny. And when, when you research how Texas got to be Texas, it was really rather fascinating that originally the... European settlers, meaning coming from the United States of America, were asked by the Mexican government at the time to move there, right? They wanted American settlers to come into Mexico to do the jobs Mexican workers weren't going to do, namely fight the Apache and Comanche, right? In this period right here, Alta California, Nuevo uh, Mexico, and Kuhu, I don't even know how to pronounce that, Kuhule, Texas, right? The Texas area was pretty much overrun with the Apache and Comanches. Now, remember, we were talking about how the Apaches came to Arizona because they got kicked out of the plains by the Comanches, right? And when the Mexican Revolution happened, Mexico no longer supported the Presidios. Remember your vocabulary words from last week, a Presidio is a fort with soldiers to fight off the Indians, the centralized Mexican government didn't care about any of those rednecks out in flyover country, so they weren't spending any money to defend them from the various Indian tribes. So, but that's going to be a problem. So what they did is they turned and looked at and looked at the United States of America and, and various Western or uh, European country, uh, countries and said, hey, why don't you start immigrating into Texas? Fully hoping that if they got enough population in there, right, that they would take care of the Apaches and Comanches. They wouldn't have to spend time one defending their northern border from the Apaches and Comanches. Sounds like a pretty good deal until you realize that what the Texas settlers were doing is they weren't running out there in West Texas 
you know, fighting the Comanche, they were holing up here on this little strip of land, if you can see this on the map, next to Louisiana, where all the good farmland was. They weren't as interested in going out into the desert and getting scalped. They wanted to farm, and so they were building up up there. So at that point, when, when the Mexican government realized, hey, wait, these immigrants aren't doing what we wanted to, want them to do, they froze immigration. All right, nobody else moves into Texas. And then they built a big wall. No, they didn't build a big wall, but you sort of see how this is going. They did tariffs, right? They enacted tariffs. And they enacted um, trade restrictions with the United States of America. Now, notice something. Right here is New Orleans, all right? Major port. Louisiana is a state at this point in time, right? It is a lot easier to get your trade goods from here to New Orleans, because you shoot right over to the Mississippi and down the Old Man River in the Mississippi, than it is to truck it across the Comanche Apache filled desert to Mexico city. All right. To then get shipped out and uh, sent somewhere else. So that's one of the, the reasons why when Santa Ana did his great, okay, guys, I'm in charge. Everybody, everything has to go through me, Texas and all these other little, little States and provinces. When I said, no, screw you. We're, we're independent. We're on Republic now. So Santa Ana, marches north, kills people at the Alamo. There's another big massacre that he was involved in. And then he lost. He gets captured. And when he gets captured, he signs a peace deal being captured. You know, I believe it was Sam Houston. I don't know my Texas history that much. Right. But he signs a peace treaty with the rebels in Texas, the, ins the Texas insurgency. Going, I hereby recognize Texas. Yeah, you win. And yay, Texas. Texas wins. Yeehaw. And San Ana is sent back down to Mexico. He's then involved in like being uh, being president, not being president. He eventually winds up in Cuba. Right? He has to flee the country. So he winds up in Cuba. He's, he's living in exile in Cuba. Make a note of that. That becomes important here in a bit. But one of the problems with this particular territory here is there was some discussion, and this is the cause belly, the reason why Mexico stated that they needed to go back into another war. So Texas has successfully had their rebellion, insurrection, revolution, whatever you want to call it. They're now the Republic of Texas. They're an independent country. They are recognized by the United States, France, and England as being an independent uh, country. And that's pretty much it for a bit. Now, Santa Ana has returned to Mexico and has been kicked out. And Mexico starts talking along the lines of, yeah, that's not a real treaty anyways. And we're still not recognizing you, even though our president recognized you because it was signed under duress. And various other conversations ensue about that. The president at this time, the name is uh, James K. Polk. And James Polk was really interested in securing what was going to be the entire North American continent for the U S and going back to this original map where we have here, he was actually in a point where he was getting an argument with um, a negotiation with England at the time about the or Oregon country, which now is pretty much Idaho, Washington, Oregon, right? And where the treaty line was going to be this area of, of Mexico called, called Alta California, which is pretty much, you know, the entire American Southwest. Um, at this point, it's, it's a very unpopulated area. There are little places along the coast. Los Angeles is, um, exists. San Francisco is, exists, but these aren't really major populated areas. In fact, California at the time was sort of looking at what happened with Texas and going, Hey, that's not a bad idea. Uh, they were actually, some of them were actually lobbying England to come in and take them over and to say, Hey, um, why don't we, you know, why don't you look, we're helpless. We're here. Oh, British empire, please don't take us over. Um, and the British empire at the time, uh, the prime minister's last name was Peel. 
And he was going to, he was actually an isolationist. So he wasn't interested in picking up California on the cheap. Um, so he was not very interested in the, the appeals of these elements in California who really, really did not want to be a part of Mexico. So Polk has, is securing the West. And there was conversation and talk about bringing Texas into the United States. Now, much like the same discussions we have every once in a while about Puerto Rico, right? Should Puerto Rico be a state? Right? And it always comes up to, yeah, sounds like a great idea, but man, that means they're going to get two senators and those two senators are going to vote for one party over the other party. And that could undo our ba happy little balance here. Um, it was the same thing with Texas, right? Um, Texas, because it was below the Mason Dixon line would have become a slave state. And more importantly to, you know, the government or the people in government, that would have been two brand new slave state senators voting as a block plus representatives in the house voting as a block and the northern states weren't having any of that but polk gets in there and polk is actually a democrat at the time i believe you yeah i believe he was a democrat he's interested in continuing this growth to the west and looks at picking up texas right and they eventually do pass the legislation and texas enters as a state in at this point, Mexico, who had been telling the U.S. the entire time, don't claim Texas as a state, don't claim Texas as a state. Now they really get fired up over this thing. Now, there is a strip of land between the Nueces River here that you can see and the Rio Grande. There is a cloud on the title. Right, to use a real estate term. There is a problem, a clearly defined boundaries, right? They are contesting the survey right? because the Texas, Republic of Texas story and the United States story is the treaty says the northern part of Mexico ends at the Rio Grande. All right here, you can see why this entire area here Right. Rio Grande actually starts in uh, Colorado. That's a lot of you guys didn't know that. It goes right down through the center of New Mexico, which is why um, New Mexico, when we the history that we were talking about over the last couple of weeks, all the settlements were happening up and down the Rio Grande because you, it's easier to travel up and down a river all right, than through the middle of the freaking desert. Right. So... Texas is saying the treaty said it was the Rio Grande. Mexico says, no, 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 you're reading it all wrong. Uh, that's not the Rio Grande. That's the Rio Bravo. All right. And the Rio Grande is actually, actually this river right here, Nueces River. Right. So you get this Nueces Strip. So Texas becomes a state. And the first thing President Polk does is they send in Major General Zachary Taylor right, to secure the Nueces Strip, all right, and to secure the southern border against Me uh, Mexico. And Mexico, not liking that idea, then sends troops forward into the Strip. They have a the first battle of the Mexican-American War. It is, actually happens before war is declared when a, a troop of 2,000 Mexican cavalrymen find a scouting American scouting party uh, of 70 on their side of what they consider the line um, and there's a fight happens 16 americans are killed uh this instantly gets communicated back to washington dc uh bloody shirts are waved speeches are given and next you know we declare war on mexico and it's on like donkey kong so major general um zachary taylor who will you might recognize that na name later on, actually winds up becoming a U.S. president, um, fights a series of battles in Mexico and starts pushing his way into Mexico proper. Um, there are three and then later four major fronts in this campaign. Right. First major front is th this South Texas, North Mex Mexico front, All right, with, you know, uh, General Taylor, you know, traveling on, uh, working his way through the populated area of Mexico right here, 
fighting several battles over and over again. All right. There is a second front that is opened up by a General Kearney, right, who comes in f through basically what would be New Mexico today. Remember when I was telling you about the, the rivers and everything like that on this map, all right, he's coming down from this direction. General Taylor's working his way through this map. So you have main force, supporting force right here. So General Taylor continuing on through these battles eventually winds up capturing one of the greatest war trophies of all time, General Santa Ana's leg. All right. And this is how that story goes out. Remember, Santa Ana is sitting out there in Cuba and the, the war is going on. Um, the Americans are actually outnumbered at this point. All right. um, they have longer supply lines and they are outnumbered. Right. They are still winning battles. All right. And they're winning battles for two reasons. All right. The first reason is they have better weapons than the Mexicans do. All right. They have um, more modern, at those time periods, cap lock rifles and cap lock muskets while the Mexican army is mostly using Napoleon War surplus brown best best muskets. Um, the rate of fire with the cap and ball is, is faster. Uh, you don't have to prime the pan. It works better in uh, bad weather conditions. Um, and so, and they also had better use of artillery. Now the Mexicans also had artillery, right? But the, the Americans had taken their artillery and gotten lighter artillery and trained them with horses and created what's called flying artillery. So they had would have artillery batteries that could move from one point to the other in the battlefield. They weren't as stable and solid um, as, you know, Mexican batteries were. That were basically, you go, you get set up, you shoot for a while, and then the battle's over and it's all done. With the American lighter artillery and more mobile artillery, they can move from point, point A to point B. The other thing that um, the Americans have going for it is they have an officer corps that is being trained out of West Point, and they have a history of big scale battles that Mexico doesn't necessarily really have. General Taylor here right, got his, earned his uh, earned his stripes, got his bones, whatever you want to call it, in the War of eighteen twelve. Now, we are 30 years down the line from the War of 1812, but he was a captain in the War of 1812. So he has fought, at that time, traditional European-style battles right. as, a, as a younger officer. He's got a lot of experience doing that. Right. The Mexican Army Officer Corps doesn't have the same kind of consistency. Um, they do have generals. The generals are, are generally promoted as being generals because they came from the aristocracy. All right. They don't have, th they just don't have the experience. The other thing is that was going on at this time is West Point, when they, with their graduating classes, West Point was a professional military academy. Now, Mexico did have, also had a military academy, and we'll get to that in a later battle. But the West Point was taking war to a science, right, with rules to be applied, which good soldiers recapitulate, well, recapitulate, recall and recapitulate before they go to decimate the other side. All right, little pip and quote there for you. Um, and so when you graduate in class of West Point happened, you would have five, <clears throat> you, you would wind up being in five, one of five groups of soldiers, right? The top of the class became engineers, right? And it's not just engineers as in going out there and dig holes and stuff like that, but they were also the logistics side. They could do bridges. They could basically handle all of the logistics and all of the thinking part of running around and doing warfare. That was the top of the class, right? After that came artillery, right? And then after artillery came infantry, uh, and then Calvary. I know there was a fifth one in there, and I think it was like just pure on logistics or something like that. But long story short, the smartest people became engineers. The second star, star, smartest people became artillery captains, lieutenants, all right? Because you have to be able to calculate how much powder, angle of inflection, to make sure that little 12-pound ball hits that guy in the head at 800 yards. 
So, and then you had the infantry and the cavalry was basically the also rants, right? Hey, yeah, congratulations. Uh, you graduated, but we're not going to let you do anything important. Here's a pretty horse to ride. Right. So, and I'm getting hints of it. Nothing, anything that Calvary for the Mexican army was where it was the best place to be. You got to ride pretty horses. You get plumes. There's plumes involved in being in the cavalry. And so instead of having that very clear distinction of depending on how you did, you got in where you got in in the Mexican uh, army, it seems to be a lot of, a lot of political connections. Hey, I want to be in the cavalry, you know, uh, or I'm, and nobody wanted to be the engineer. So, because there's no glory in being an engineer, unless you're an engineer. Um, so that all being said, you get this mix match just in the, in the entire officer corps. The other thing is, is that the U S had a professional military at the time, once again, coming off the war of 1812 and they were the, even the NCOs and their training was set up to do like on like force on force battles, not necessarily chasing the insurrectionists and Indians around like the other Mexican uh, military had. And you see this time and time again in these battles, um, the Mexican soldiers fight bravely. They're commonly called out by the U S side as going, man, these are some brave guys. Look at that guy. He, he stood there like a rock putting lead down range until we ran him over. All right. Didn't run. All right? So it was, it was well regarded by, uh, U S officers after the war is that the Mexican soldier individually was some of the bravest people they've ever seen. Horribly led, horribly supplied and, horribly mistreated by their officer corps. Yet even then we're looking at odds of 45,000 Mexicans against 15 or 16,000 Americans in some of these battles. And the campaign heading south is starting to run into a slog because they, they're getting into the high desert there. They're literally moving from water point to water point and there's only so much farther they can get. So they decide they, they were going to try to break Th this stalemate and they go to Santa Ana who's hiding out there in Cuba and Cuba and Santa Ana has been approaching the Mexican government going, Hey, let me talk to him. Let me talk to him. Let me talk. To him. I'll get him straightened out. All right. We can go, you know, let me go in there. They love me. And the, and the greatest negotiator, greatest in all time. I will go in there, talk them out and we'll, we'll get this thing resolved. And so the, um, American Navy lets Santa Ana into Mexico. Santa Ana instantly becomes president. All right. And during the Mexican American war, there were, I think I read somewhere nine different sitting presidents in a two year period. All right. They were constantly trading. All right. Who was in charge back and forth. And this means the strategic goals of Mexico and the plans for achieving those strategic goals were being traded back and forth you know, as the new administration came in, right? Santa Ana was supposed to fix all that. So instead of coming in and negotiating, uh, settling a peace, he instantly takes charge of the army and marches north, right? And as he's marching north, he's pulling troops from these areas closer to Mexico City and really conscripting them. I mean, just like grabbing them off the street in some uh, accounts, all right? And hey, here's your rum drink. You're in the army now kind of stuff and, and marching north to do battle. And in one of these battles, he is, his rear area is overrun and he actually loses his wooden leg, which is still held today in the state of Illinois, right? This is a war trophy. We still have this. All right. Every once in a while they make noises about getting it back and we say, come and get it. All right. That's, that's how this works out. He actually lost this leg. All right. In that French pastry war that I was talking about earlier. All right. All right. But he is the El Presidente. He, and he has what's called the internal lines. All right. He, because he can fall back closer to his sources of supply as the Americans get farther and farther away from their sources of supply. And this is where the United States Navy comes in, all right? Because really early on in the war, the Navy, because the Navy always has to find something to do, had 
two different groups of ships doing two different things. The first group was blockading the west coast of Mexico or the east coast of Mexico from Europe to make sure people did not bring weapons into Mexico. And Mexico was able to get its surplus out for, for currency. They also blockaded the west coast. And this west coast here is where we get the third front going on in the Mexican-American War. All right. We already have, we already discussed Kearney. All right. He's coming down the Rio Grande, hits here. Part of his forces keep heading south. The other part takes a hard right and comes in, follows this area across. All right. There's also a gentleman by the name of Fremont. Now, what's interesting about Fremont is that Fremont was an air quote, explorer and surveyor who had been running around the Great Basin area, okay, which is modern day Nevada and Utah, and various parts, mapping and surveying, and occasionally he would come across some uh, a Mexican soldier or something, he would say, hey, what are you doing here? And he would come up with some weird excuse, oh, he just came to get supplies, you know, in the middle of, you know, the northern Nevada desert, right? And he was running around up here. And when the Civil War kicked off, I mean, the Mexican-American War kicked off, um, California revolted against Mexico. It's called uh, the Bear Republic Revolt. Right? And all of Alta California, right, technically be that was the revolt of this territory here. The same territory, as we noticed, Fremont's running around it. Was he starting some of that? Probably. He probably had some filibuster intentions or whatnot. But... This then force, this Bear Republic force, then comes underneath the command of Fremont, and he starts working his way down the coast, right? First, you know, through uh, San Francisco, down to Monterey. At the same time, the American Navy is working its way up the coast, right? Also securing, they first, you know, these various ports. So they're starting to cl close off these western ports, which would not be a lot of uh, use to Mexico proper because this is a very unpopulated part of Mexico at the time. And because of lack of rail lines or anything, they would be any supplies that were landed there would be would take forever to get to Mexico City proper. But they eventually wind up securing all of California or liberating the Republic of California, or the Bear Republic. And about this time, uh, Kearney comes across. We're going to get back to this in a few uh, in a few minutes, right? But with the blockade here, and the Santa Ana gambit doesn't happen, all right? Santa Ana then instantly takes over the government, all right? Takes over and starts fighting the Americans again some more. They, the U.S. decides to do, open up a fourth front. All right. And the fourth front is really the one that ends it all. All right. Not directly. It takes a little time. But let me show you what happens here. General, General Winfield Scott. All right. He too earned his bones in the War of 1812. All right. At this point, he is the grand old man of the army. He's actually around during the Civil War, I think. All right, uh, was not actually considered fit for field duty or anything like that. But he is given command of the amphibious invasion that kicks off right down here. Right, the shortest port, the closest port to actual, actual Mexico City. So they're now going for a decapitation strike. We're tied up here in the desert. Right, we don't have decent ports to get to. Right, to get resupplied, we're moving from water hole to water hole. All right. So General Scott does an end around on them. All right. They land and they march in and effectively wind up taking over Mexico City. Right. The capture and conquest of Mexico City pretty much puts paid to, to, to the rest of the Mexican American War. There is a settle there's various peace treaties go on, various communications and talking and happening what there is insurrection fighting, right? But Santa Ana does, makes a, another attack, not directly upon Mexico City, but on the supply lines of the American army to it. They're beaten back. Um, looking at the at the history that's been going on consistently on this thing. Um Mexico City was in a strong defended position. I mean, almost from a numerical advantage thing, General Winfield Scott should not have been able to take Mexico City. Right? But what happened was that the individual generals 
uh, Mexican generals are too busy fighting amongst themselves to really be able to bring up a proper defense. There was a um, video I was watching about the, the, the capture of Mexico City. And at one point, uh, one of the Mexican generals who wants to be the hero and the president of the country after they beat the Americans, marches his army out of their prepared positions to go fight the Americans all right, and starts getting massacred. His other general, his air quote buddy, watching this, finds himself in a position to launch an attack into the American army's flanks. Right, possibly routing them and stopping this entire invasion of Mexico City. But instead of doing that, he decides to watch his political opponent die horribly. Right? And Mexico City falls. Like I said, um, do, not, do not make fun of the country of Mexico for losing the Mexican-American War. Right? The individual soldiers uh, fought very well, very hard, but damn, they had a problem with their elites. Uh, their elites were too busy being elites instead of looking after the, the country itself. Right? So the treaty that comes out of this, right, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, seeds this entire area, which if you remember from the map we we're looking at, this is Alta California all right, and uh, Nuevo Mexico all right, to the U.S., Right, using the borders of the Rio Grande and the Gila River, right, and then from that point straight across, they cede that to the United States. United States then pays them uh, fifteen million dollars and also takes on three and a half. I want to say it was like three and a half million dollars of debt that the Mexican government owed to U.S. citizens for whatever reason. Right, so for eighteen million dollars total, this all gets uh, ceded over to the U.S. Strangely enough, back in the day before the whole war kicked off, Polk was actually trying to negotiate uh, a Louisiana purchase style and was offering $25 million for all the land that they took. Right. But for you know, it's but for some reason Mexico did not. And you know, some of the common problems with that is during the point when Polk is making the offer, they would write the offer, Dear President Joey, and send it off to Mexico. And by the time it got to the president of Mexico, it was no longer President Joey. It was somebody else. All right. um, at one point, I saw something where it's like in the course of um, the time they went through seven different treasury officers. All right. So, so trying to buy it for $25 million, not getting it, winding up buying it for $18 million and in fair trade of giving Mexico City back and the various ports and whatnot that had been uh, saved. As we here in Arizona all know, this part, part short of the Gila River all right, is later on sold to the United States so we could run some train, train lines through there. And that's the end of the Mexican War. It does not stop fighting on this border, however. This border is um, still populated by um, various native tribes who do not recognize the white boys' uh, borders. And so Navajo are raiding south of the borderline in Mexico. Mexican soldiers are chasing, you know, the Apaches, I mean, the Apaches north. Back and forth happens uh, right up to pa Pancho Villa was still going on in the early 19th century or 20th century, 1900s. This this border, and right up to the point where, like during the World War One, there was, it's not just like the Zimmerman telegram. Germany was actively courting New Mexico or Mexico uh, to come in on the side of Germany in case the U.S. came in on the side of uh, England, and actually did have German soldiers, military advisors, you know, working with the Mexican. Uh, government and the Mexican military during this whole thing. Supposedly to hunt down Pancho Villa and everything like that, but they did a lot of hunting north of the line. Um, this is the end of pretty much major conflict in North America. In North America. Uh, we've already had our fight with Canada. War of 1812. We lost. They burned the White House. All right. We've taken over the, um, this, Mexico is going to have another series of battles or little civil wars, little rebellions. They eventually do wind up taking the, the Yucatan again. Uh, they are going to have various different presidents kick in and kick out. And it was really their 
their instability and lack of being able to form a, a uh, government that could stay around for a while is what, you know, um, and some would argue even today, uh, does Mexico still have control of, Mexico federal government still have control of most of its country? Are there places there where they can send soldiers and not have to worry about the soldiers getting blown up by cartels? Right? But this is our neighbors to the south. This is how life's going for them. So, Mexican War. Now, there are two great stories that come out of the Mexican War. And I really want to get these things out. One of them you probably know. One of them you might not know. Right? Uh, there, this is a very large campaign. There are so many things going on. People have made so many videos that I'm going to include some of them in the show notes below because so there's a lot of people who have put a lot more work into it, a much better job talking about the individual stuff on this. Um, but the first one, you know, there are two units, three units, st storied units, um, honestly. All right. But we're give, going to give the two of them that aren't as well known a little bit more uh, exposure here today. All right. And the first one is the Mormon Battalion. Now, the Mormon Battalion at the time, and I think ever, is the first and only religious military organization, right? No other unit in the United States military has been formed around a particular religion. Right? And the Mormon battalion was formed up on the border of Kansas and Missouri. Now, Mormons at the time, the LDS church, right, had been pushed out of Missouri right, because they had this just uncanny ability to sit in a place for a certain amount of time and then people wanted to kill them. Right. Um, so they had already left New York, left Illinois, left Missouri, and now they're sitting out there on the plains of Kansas and they're trying to negotiate with the federal government for a place to go. And there was a lobbyist who was working with the LDS church at the time who gave them the suggestion when the war was kicking off, hey, you should form up a regiment or a battalion, a military organization put it under command of the United States military that will do a lot to deal with your PR problem of everybody thinks that you're trying to secede from the, the, um, the country, right? And prove that you're loyal citizens of the United States, right? So they form up the Mormon battalion and the Mormon battalion has a rather adventurous campaign. They, they march across, they form up with Kearney, as we know, it came, was coming down the Rio Grande, all right? And then hits this point, and they were actually only involved in two major battles, all right? And neither one of them were actually considered battles, all right? The most bloody battle was called the Battle of the Bulls, all right? And this, this is historical. It happened here in Arizona. The um, Mormon battalion ran across some herds of cattle. And the herds of cattle, for whatever reason, several bulls charged the Mormon battalion, injured a few people, uh, and then eventually uh, the Mormon battalion rallied. They formed ranks, volley fired directly into the attacking forces, and managed to defeat a cow herd. Right? And they were well fed that night. Right. So that's the Battle of the Bulls. Right? The second one was the, the Battle of Tucson, which isn't even really a battle. But they, they arrived in Tucson and the uh, the Mexican um, unit that had been stationed there had already retreated south. So they seized Tucson and then followed the Gila River down through to the Colorado and then worked their way across uh, to San Diego. They spent a period of time marching up and down um, the, the California Peninsula or California uh, coastline. And when Kearney is recalled uh, back to D.C. and everything, they escort him across. They actually come across, um, some of them stop at Sutter's Fort, all right, and they work their way. They find uh, remnants of the Donner Party and bury them. They actually wind up traveling all the way up with Kearney up through southern Idaho and then working their way back down the Oregon Trail, all right, where they return to home. And they were released. So that's that's the uh, trek of the Mormon battalion. They started, I thought this was interesting, they started uh, at Fort Leavenworth in August 15th, uh, 1846, and they actually returned back. Uh, they, let's see, they mustered uh, at Fort Leavenworth, or they equipped, mustered on July 16th, 
Uh, they are equipped at Fort Leavenworth during the first two weeks of August. All right, they trek out. Right, and they actually return back to Fort Leavenworth on August 22nd. So this entire campaign that they did trek took them just a few weeks over a year, right? And wound up seeing pretty much every Western state or soon to be state, except for Oregon and Washington. The second, um, <clears throat> the second, but a unit I want to talk about is a lot more well-known and storied outside of the Western states, uh, states without an LDS presence, right? This story is uh, well-known by any, uh, throughout the world, especially by the Irish, all right? And they are the Battalion de San Patricio, all right? The, the St. Patrick's, Battalion of St. Patrick's, all right? St. Patrick's Battalion was an Irish battalion <clears throat> that fought for Mexico, and most of them were deserters of the U.S. Army. So, I've been talking a lot. No, I'm not getting choked up about this. So, um, the St. Patrick's Battalion, these guys, their whole bunch of the United States military at the time was <clears throat> there's two types of military, right? There's the regulars, people who come up and join the military, and then you have volunteers, in some cases voluntolds. Right? The American army at this time was pretty much, uh, starting at the beginning of this war, had a few regular units, and then a whole bunch of people who had volunteered. The regular units could send individual, well-trained indiv uh, people over to the volunteers. And over the course of time, the volunteers would get up, you know, with, through training, get to the point where they, they could stand and fight like the regular soldiers. Right? And these soldiers came from all over the world. Right? Um, it was a career choice, especially for the Irish, right? The Irish used the term the wild geese. Right. Those are Irish lads who go overseas and fight countries all right, for other countries and sometimes come home. Usually they don't. All right. um, but you have Irish join. <coughs> uh, we, we discussed this earlier, you know, with uh, the guy who founded um, Tucson. Right. Irish guy goes to Spain, winds up in Mexico, winds up fi finding uh, founding Tucson. Um, these these Irish soldiers who were in the United States Army under, in many cases, Protestant officers who had a rather low view of all things Catholic um, were <clears throat> these Irish uh, Catholic soldiers, you know, felt that they had more in common with the Mexican people than they did with the American people right? because they were Catholic. And this is something a lot of Americans don't understand to this day because we, you know, our society does not put as much emphasis on religion. But when you're from Ireland, the difference between Protestant and Catholic is a pretty damn big thing. In fact, if you're from um, the British Isles at all, right, difference between Catholic and Protestant at this time period was still a pretty much a big thing. Right. <clears throat> so the, 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 the battalion, these, these Irish... Um, soldiers who were in the American army realizing that they are not, you know, being treated well and they're being forced to fight their co-religionists started deserting. There are a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of stories. And we don't know if they're truth. We don't know if they're fiction of the first Irish uh, soldiers to um, run across and join the Mexicans did that because they were facing punishment because they missed formation because they left to tr to travel down and have mass at a Mexican church. And when they came back from having mass, their Protestant officers decided to punish them for not being where they were supposed to be. Regardless of the fact, the Irish all get together <clears throat> and they were formed by the Mexican government as an individual unit called the battalions, uh, Battalion de San Patricio. And they wind up fighting against the Americans for the Mexicans. And they were one of the few actually trained and organized uh, units. Now remember, 
the Americans, one of their benefits is they have a professional military. The Mexican military has officers who are supposedly <clears throat> trained, but you know, the, the ones that have any combat experience whatsoever have combat experience ambushing and getting ambushed by Indians or occasionally going into a village that is protesting against its high taxes and slaughtering everybody there. All right, so this battalion here is one of the few truly, truly professionally trained, and they are an artillery unit. And there's a couple battles there where these guys right here pretty much save the Mexican army from total defeat. Right by standing their ground, there is a battle uh, that they're can't remember the name of it right now, but uh, the, the Irish battalions dug in with a bunch of Mexican volunteers and Mexican uh, levy troops, and they're they're getting it hot and heavy, and the Mexicans start trying to surrender. And the first guy runs over to the flag and starts pulling it down and starts trying to raise the white flag. And he's stopped by the Irish because the Irish aren't done fighting yet. And this goes on through the course of the battle is that occasionally a Mexican would run over to try to pull the flag down and run the white flag up. And the Irish just got to the point where they got sick of fighting with these guys. So they just shoot them. All right. And they were able to retreat out of that position in good, you know, in good order and saving a big chunk of the Mexican army. All right. So just like, just like Ukrainians, don't piss the Irish off, right? Eventually all good things have to come to the end. Um, the, the battalion is constantly put into the thickest part of the fights because they are the one unit that the, um, the Mexican generals, especially Santa Ana here, remember Glass Joe from earlier, can depend on to hold a position. Right? And they start getting captured individually. And they're not treated as a traditional prisoner of war. They're, con they're treated as a deserter, right? which is bad. Right? But they're also treated as a traitor because they were with the U.S. Army and now they are fighting for the other side. Right? And the sentence for that was firing squad, death by firing squad. For various reasons, uh, General Scott, remember this guy right up here, right, decided he didn't want to waste a bullet on these guys. Right? So he sentenced them to hang, which is uh, was considered a lower form of death. Right? Death by firing squad, you're dying like a man, taking a bullet in the chest, just like your buddies did, right? Hanging, that's for that's for spies, that's for, you know, traitors of the low sort, you know, murderers, cattle thieves, that kind of stuff. So, General Scott has ordered these guys uh, to be hung. Now, there there is a battle that's coming up right now, and this is called the Battle of uh, Kapolnicek. Or Peck. I, I can never say that. And I should know this one. This is a battle was fought at what the Mexican equivalent of West Point was. Right. This was a military academy of junior high school age and high school age students. And it is the last defense between coming up from the coast and Mexico City proper. And General Scott or I don't think it was actually General Scott. I think it was a subordinate. He um, he assigned to to um, to take uh, hang the um, the people that they had captured. Decided that he was going to hang them when the when the citadel fell. Now this battle is very very deeply remembered by the Mexican people because of uh, the child heroes, the Ninos, whatever. The remember this place is being defended, but it's also being defended by cadets, junior high school age cadets, high school age cadets, right? And there were five cadets who refused to surrender. As the under orders of the American general, the Irishmen who were to be hung were, would be were placed in the gallows, and they were placed uh, facing uh, the citadel that the Americans were attacking. Now, the Americans were attacking was a combination of U.S. Army troops and United States Marines. The line from the United States, uh, the Marine Corps hymn from the halls of Montezuma, that line is talking about this battle right here. Uh, the United States Marine Corps to this day on its dress blue uniforms has a red blood stripe for NCOs and officers. Right? And that blood stripe is there to commemorate this battle right here.
And as the American forces um, charge through, and there's a great video on the battle on this thing, and I'll find it and put it in the show notes below. All right. As they are uh, making the final assault on this, the, there's a young man who, as a cadet, takes down the Mexican flag, wraps it around his body, and throws himself off the cliff so it's not captured by the American soldiers. That's the that's the story. I don't know if that's true or not, right? But that's a goddamn good story, don't you think? So at the same time, the American general had told that the Irish, the Irish, you will hang when you see that flag come down, right? And according to public sources and public records and firsthand information, uh, yeah, you can tie the Irish up. And you can tie his uh, neck up and everything like that. But you can't get him to shut their mouths. So as the general is sitting there waiting for the flag to come down, he is sitting there and having to listen to these Irish all right, um, express the God-given blessing and curse on the Irish people. And they're just running their yap at him the entire time. And every time something happens, they cheer. All right. And the general had to put up with it. I mean, this this is this, this general here, and I, I gotta find his name, but you know, I almost don't want to repeat his name because he's such a dirtbag. All right, he was going to hang thirty guys. He only had twenty nine guys on him. He went looking for the thirtieth one and found a, an Irish soldier who had both of his legs blown off. All right, and dragged him out and was sitting him up there. All right, but eventually, when that young man pulls down the Mexican flag, all right. They kick the horses out or they kick the, the stools out from underneath these Irishmen and they are hung at that point. This turns in a really interesting story later on because the Mexican people know this story. And now you know this story. The American people at the time never heard of this. This story was suppressed. Right? The story of the uh, San, San Patricio Battalion and how these uh, soldiers were treated was suppressed for the longest time right, until eventually came out in uh, 1915 when the army actually commissioned a, a finding, an investigation, fear exactly what happened in this situation. All right. So that is the Battalion de St. Pat Patrick's Battalion. There is um, just a million songs mostly Irish songs, a couple of great folk songs written about this particular unit. Um, there were survivors of the unit. They became part of the uh, Mexican people. They um, married, immigrated. That's why you still have Irish names in certain areas, especially Mexico City. Um, just, a, it, just a fascinating story, and I, I, I love telling it. Apparently there is a movie out on it that's really um, – Sounds very, very fictiony, but uh, it's got Tom Berenger playing an Irishman in this thing. So that wraps this up. One of the fun things about uh, history is that, you know, there's an old saying that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Uh, as I'm sitting here researching the Mexican-American War, I'm seeing a lot of comparisons about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Now, remember, when I started this a couple of weeks ago, all right, it was, I started it just almost as a lark, all right? It's like, hey, yeah, um, you know, Russia is having a title dispute with Ukraine. They think they own this thing, right? And so, hey, wouldn't it be funny if we figure out, you know, talk about the Mexican-American War? What we have here, though, is there's some striking parallels between the two. We have a breakaway province of a country that is I'm trying to find a really good map to explain it. We have a breakaway progress, you know, province of a country. Let's call it Donbass or Crimea, all right? That does not have the same population type as the rest of the major country. They have a independent revolt, all right? That is supported by a bigger, bigger country. Right. You have uh, a better organized or a better equipped military at this point. Um, but at some points, it, it, it doesn't become a perfect, perfect comparison. All right. As we can see with the Ukrainian people, all right, um, 
people fighting for their own country fight a lot harder than people who are fighting to invade another country, right? And the Ukrainians can have worse equipment than the Russians do, right? The Russians have better equipment, but the Ukrainians have better training, all right? This uh, shows you the, you know, um, Napoleon's quote, the morale is to physical as three is to one, right? But when you have, when you have these borders, these distributed, dis disputed borders, and when you have a border with a population type that is overlapping that imaginary line driven on the ground, you know, you get the Mexican American War, you get the Russian invasion of Donbass, you get a gazillion wars in Africa because some European decided to drive, draw a line right through the middle of something. Right. And this is a continu uh, continuing thing. People, you know, I know people were shocked at the concept of, you know, a modern day 21st century war. These humans don't change. Right? These people who are running around the 19th, you know, 1800s and whatnot fighting this war here. Um, we're not any genetically different from them. Can't even say we're better educated them, right? Um, one thing I, I wanted to point out of this is that, all right, people who wound up being president, like Zachary Taylor, fight this one. There are these major, these generals in these campaigns fought in the War of 1812. And in the Civil War, the names that you hear in the Civil War were captains and lieutenants in the Mexican-American War. Right, U Ulysses S. Grant becomes president. Right, he's a captain in this war. Right, General Robert E. Lee, all right, is fighting in this war. Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, is a U.S. soldier fighting in this war. Right? This and it's their experience of the Mexican-American War as generals now that they then carry over. Right? There were veterans of the Civil War, all right, who were fighting in the Spanish-American War. There were Spanish-American War veterans who were fighting in World War One. There was World War One veterans who were fighting in World War Two in the Korean War, and so on and so on and so forth. We're not too far historically removed from these individuals. And in fact, I saw something once where there was somebody who was, he was like the great-grandson of, no wait, it was like the grandson of like Polk or something is still alive today. Let's wrap your head around that one. So, anyways, I'm starting to I'm starting to ramble on and stuff like that. This is the end of this episode, this series, and I hope you guys stuck through it. It's going to take me forever to render this thing out, but thank you very much for watching. You guys have a great weekend. Um, be careful out there. Keep working your circles, and I'll catch you next week. Thanks, guys.